Welcome to the League of Women Voters and the City Club Candidates Forum for Secretary of State. I want to thank and welcome today's candidates. This is brought to you by the League of Women Voters, as I said, at City Club of Central Oregon. These are two organizations that are passionately nonpartisan and whose purpose today is to engage and inform Oregon voters for the general election. Today, we are hosting candidates for Secretary of State. The Secretary of State is an extremely important position because in case of the governor is unable to perform their duties, the Secretary of State is the next in line. The Secretary of State also runs the Office of State Archives, Audits, Corporations, and Elections, and three supporting divisions for the state, including the State Business Services, Informational Systems, and Human Resources. As you can see, this is a very important job. My name is Kim Scott Smith, and I am a League of Women Voters past president, and I'm honored to serve as the moderator for today's forum. First, I'd like to give a quick shout out to City Club's annual sponsors. Without their support, we would not be able to bring you today's program. Today's live stream is also made possible by Connect Central Oregon, a nonprofit launched with the assistance of OSU Cascades Innovation CoLab. And a special thank you to Scott Breeze for handling the technical aspects of our forum today. Our sponsor for the entire Cities of Candidate Forums are, as I said, the League of Women Voters of Deschutes County, the City Club of Central Oregon, and also the Deschutes Public Library and Buchanan Schmidt LLC. We are grateful for their support and these educational forums. If you are interested in supporting City Club or the League of Women Voters of Deschutes County, please check out our websites and get more information. I will give you those link. I will give you the, that information at the end of the forum today. Our candidate forums are conducted according to the League of Women Voter guidelines. All candidates filed in their race are invited to participate in our forums, and we hope to present voters with all participants. In the interest of fairness, we do not let an RSVP or regrets cancel a forum. Thank you to the Secretary of State candidates for participating in today's forum. We appreciate the gravity of committing to run for office, and our goal is to provide an opportunity for fair and civil discourse. We start with opening statements. Each candidate will have two minutes for their opening remarks, and each question, each candidate will have two minutes to answer. At the end, each candidate may give a two-minute closing statement. For opening and closing statements, we have randomly selected the order and questions will be rotated for the candidates. So if we're ready, let's get started. So for the candidates, I'd like to offer you to do your opening statements for two minutes. And our first, Shamia Fagan, will you please do your opening statement? Well, thank you, Kim, and thank you, League of Women Voters and the City Club of Central Oregon. My name is Shamia Fagan, and before I get started, I just want to acknowledge what an incredibly difficult time this is for our world and our country and our state. And I sincerely hope that all of you and your loved ones are safe and secure and getting what you need during this difficult time. I know that when I see little towns like Talent and Detroit and others suffer such immeasurable loss, it's, it really hits home for me because I grew up in very similar little towns in Wasco County. I grew up in the Dalles and Dufer, and my mom was in and out of our lives because she battled meth and opioid addiction and homelessness for most of my life. My dad raised my two older brothers and me by himself, and we had a hard time making ends meet. And in fact, the summer before I started second grade, my dad took us on this really cool two-week camping trip. I remember catching crawdads and Eight Mile Creek and Dufer and roasting marshmallows and sleeping in a big family tent. It wasn't until many years later that my older brothers told me what really happened, that we had been evicted from our home in the Dalles and we had nowhere to go, that we were homeless. My dad just didn't want us to know and so he took us on a camping trip. And that's why I've spent my career as both a civil rights lawyer and also an Oregon lawmaker fighting for other families who are hanging on by a thread, passing policies like paid sick leave and raising the minimum wage, and also making sure that we encourage participation and knock down barriers for our democracy. You know, when I first announced my campaign for Secretary of State, I quickly learned that most people have no idea what this job is. I see it as 
an opportunity to make sure that government works for everybody, running fair and free, secure elections, auditing state revenues, and making sure that our government is transparent and accountable. Thank you, Shamia, for your comments. Um, next will be Kim Thatcher. Kim Thatcher, your opening statement. Kim, you're muted. There you're not, go ahead. My goodness, <laughs> thank you, Kim, and thank you, League of Women Voters and City Club of Central Oregon. Uh, Oregon's at a crossroads and our next Secretary of State needs to be a strong, steady leader committed to getting Oregon back on track. Oregon's response to COVID, riots, fires, and whatever else is coming next will be my top priorities. Since I was elected to the House in 2004 and cleared through my service into the Senate today, my focus has been on many issues that deal directly with the Secretary of State's office, especially as the longest serving member of the Legislative Audits Committee. The Audits Division is where hard questions can get answers to help get Oregon back on track, such as how come thousands of unemployed Oregonians have yet to receive their benefits? And how do we know billions of dollars in education funding is actually helping students succeed? How can we better manage Oregon's forests and wildfire response? With ballots going out soon and thousands of mailboxes having been burned down, I've advocated for these displaced voters and our state, I think, should be doing much more to help them. Oregon's vote by mail has safeguards, but as this disaster shows, there's always room for improvement. Over the years, I've worked on many election integrity issues, and along with my 16 years in the legislature, I've, uh, I've been a small business owner for 28 years. I have two uh, companies that deal with road construction, lots of moving parts and people and things to manage. This gives me management experience that will help me run the Secretary of State's office. And more importantly, my business experience led me to passing a bill in 2011, which eventually created the Small Business Advocates Office located in the Secretary of State's office. And that is so clearly needed right now. Oregon needs a Secretary of State who is a steady experienced leader who will work to get Oregon back on track and one that sees this position with a nonpartisan lens. My name is Kim. I appreciate your vote in November. Thank you very much, Kim. Appreciate the, that opening statement. Next is Shamia. No, Natalie. Excuse me, Natalie. I'm sorry, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> Just learning. Thank you, Natalie. You're next for your two-minute opening statement. Yes, good morning. My name is Natalie Paravicini. I'm a naturopathic doctor in Oregon. I provide primary care, primarily a big part of my constituency is Medicaid patients. I see a lot of low-income people. I worked in a, a pain clinic and I saw firsthand how much poor white folks suffer in Oregon. And I have also worked as a doctor in an, a clinic for undocumented migrant workers and I have seen their struggles. I'm a first uh, generation migrant. My mother had to work cleaning houses at some point because we couldn't make hands meet. Uh, so I know the struggles that many people face when you're trying to make it. I think uh, uh, we are at a crossroads. Uh, the fires and the response to COVID show the failings of a system that really tends to benefit big corporations. I just cannot believe that the CARES Act passed 12 billion for the oil industry when they are so uh, embroiled in climate change that fuel the fires. Likewise, I cannot believe that our White House is uh, undermining completely public health by not supporting basic hygiene like wearing the masks. Um, the, as, a secretary, as a secretary of state and potential governor, um, you do need strong leadership and having focus in, um, in, in being able to work together, bring people and having a vision of where you want, what type of economy we want in the future. Um, I think that the land need to be much better managed, but they are not to be sold. I think that uh, voting by mail is extremely safe. If you can pay and buy stuff online, I mean, and by mail, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to vote by mail. It is a little bit of an absurdity, especially because Oregon has such a strong vote by mail. So register now, get your friends to register and vote. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie, for your comments. Um, having a little problem with unmuting myself. And next, we will go on to our first question. 
These questions were written up by league members and also requested from people outside of the league to send in their questions. Our first question that um, Kim, you will be the first person answering. Annette, um, the first question is, are there any changes in laws or rules that you are considering for presentation to the legislature if you are, if you become Secretary of State? Kim, unmute yourself, please. I gotcha. All right, so changes in laws and rules. There are, I passed, the very first bill that I passed in 2005 had to do with uh, looking at administrative rules, having agencies look at them every five years to make sure that they are still uh, working, that they're still necessary, and maybe there's a different way of doing it or better way. And those, uh, I would really like to make sure that that's followed up with. I'm not sure that all the agencies are doing that. But beyond that, working with the Small Business Advocates Office, they deal with small businesses that are having to run into bureaucratic barriers, red tape, and things like that. I would like to look for some common themes among the situations that small businesses encounter. And I would like to advocate for some changes or maybe relaxation or taking to account the size of a business, whatever those things may be. Uh, there's also uh, the situation with you know, the voting, uh, making sure that we look at our disaster response, making it more uh, available to for people to vote in person if if they cannot get to their county clerk's offices, any county clerk's offices, and because of roads being shut down all over the state for who knows how long, it's very difficult for people to get to a county clerk's office at some time. So it just makes sense to me to make some accommodations in these situations where there's some disaster and it's difficult to get to uh, one's ballot. Thank you very much, Kim. I have Natalie, you're next. I'll repeat the question. Are there any changes in laws or rules that you are considering for presentation to the legislature if you become the Secretary of State? Well, two of the reasons that I am running for Secretary of State are electoral reform and campaign finance reform. So we're gonna have the opportunity to vote on a measure this election to allow for campaign finance reform. And I would very aggressively enforce it. I would enforce existing laws and enforce campaign finance reform. Our, our elections are not for sale. <clears throat> the other measure that I would strongly push for is ranked choice voting, the adoption of ranked choice voting across the state. It would allow for more participation in the voting system, in the voting process because you would have this spoiler issue would go away and people can get more enthused by having more candidates run that represent their values without the fear that somebody else that you really don't want gets elected. It would bring, it would focus the elections much more on the issues because you don't want to um, present your candidates negatively. And um, it would, it, I think 35%, up to 35% of the um, potential voters in the United States don't vote because they are completely disaffected by the parties. They, because the parties tend to represent big business and are out of touch with what we really need to, know, to do. Climate change is gonna require dramatic, dramatic, changed what we're seeing is only the beginning and so that's why we need people who are willing to present radical positions and radical change onto the economy right now so ranked choice voting would be one of my priorities um, for uh, because we really need a democracy in the united states not a plutocracy and and i apologize if i insult anybody who is watching this but it is a reality um, i see this as a doctor when i have to face uh, insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies and what goes on on the ground for most people every day. So those would be a priority for me as a Secretary of State in terms of legislation. Well, thank you, Natalie, for your answer. Um, Shamia, you are next. Would you like me to repeat the question? Sure. Are there any changes in laws or rules that you are considering for presentation to the legislature if you are if you become the Secretary of State? 
Well, any changes to laws or rules that I would propose would be ones that were directly relating to the Secretary of State's office and and making our democracy work better. And so here are some that I think would be important changes. One is to make sure that ballots cast in the mail by election day, if they're postmarked by election day, that those count, uh, that we actually turn every mailbox in Oregon into a ballot box. I would also try to institute either by rule or statute ballot tracking for all 36 counties. Right now in three counties in Oregon, Multnomah, Marion, and Yamhill, folks can actually get a text message to confirm their ballot has been received and counted. That's something that all 36 counties in Oregon should enjoy. I will very much be involved in our campaign finance contribution or campaign finance reform and campaign finance contribution limits. I think it's very important that voters uh, support measure 107 this fall, which I was happy to support as SJR 18 to amend the Oregon Constitution to allow campaign finance limits. And I think it's very important as the person who oversees the elections division to really be involved, not only to make sure that our campaign finance laws reflect Oregon values, but that it is a workable system that can be enforced by the Secretary of State. I also think we need legislation to discourage uh, legislators from walking out and shutting down the government. I think that's a really important good government pro-democracy that folks have to accept the outcome of elections and shouldn't continue to get paid by taxpayers when they don't show up and do their jobs. And finally, if redistricting is something that comes to me because of census delays or any other reason, I will be proud to conduct redistricting using a nonpartisan independent commission that is also rooted in racial equity and representation. And then if that is something that, that produces the results that Oregonians want to see, which I expect it would, I would be amending, I would be referring that to the Oregon Constitution to amend the Constitution to have that be the way we do redistricting going forward. Thank you for your comments, Mia. Our sec next question, Natalie, you'll be the first to answer it. The next question is, the Secretary of State often em employs over 200 people. What previous experience do you have in management or overseeing staff? <clears throat> I do not have the experience of overseeing a large staff, but I uh, have or, or, overseen very large campaigns, particularly in Texas. I know that uh, I am a very good delegator. I am also as a, as a doctor and as a, and I tend to be very detail oriented. I research my things. I know what I'm talking about. I think that in terms of leadership, when you lead a large organization, what's very important and the key central point of leadership is the culture that you institute within the leadership and selecting good people that you delegate and fully delegate and train and allow people to do their jobs by providing the training and the resources. I know a lot about management, not in the business sector, but outside of the business sector. And those are fundamentals. And uh, I am not bound by party or by conviction. I think that people need to learn how to get along nowadays and to really look at focus at the common good and the public good before they look at their own little pocket. And um, so in terms of that, in terms of leadership and having the qualities to, or, uh, to lead a large organization, I know that I am very experienced because I have worked with all walks of life in very difficult campaigns and what you need at the top is really leadership and um, establishing a good culture where people are valued and trained and provided the resources. I don't Thank have you. anything more to add. I don't need to fill my two minutes. That's <laughs> fine. That's That works just great. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, the next, Shamia, um, you'll be answering the same question. The Secretary of State's office employs over 200 people. What previous experience do you have in management or overseeing staff? Well, I'm very happy to bring um, a decade of legal, legal experience specifically in employment law, both uh, advising businesses, large and small, and also representing employees to this, this role, um, having, having dealt with literally hundreds of cases uh, in my legal practice and advising companies on how to be good employers. And I run, I am the managing partner of the law office that I have here in, or in Oregon of a, a large multi-state law firm. And I think it's important as an employer to have your values reflected in your, the way that you work. And I was very proud in my, in my very large law firm in my office here in Portland to be the first to offer paid family and medical leave to my employees. At the time, I, my legal assistant had a baby and I was proud to give her 12 weeks of full paid family leave 
uh, even though that was not a policy throughout my entire law firm, which, which has many, many employees across multiple states. And I'm proud that after seeing my example over here in Portland, that my law firm then instituted that policy nationwide to make sure that all of our employees have that benefit. And so I will certainly um, have the ability, I have written employment handbooks, I have definitely bring that experience here, having obviously overseen campaign staff, legislative staff, and staff in my legal practice. And I will make sure that not only do the, uh, does the Secretary of State's office reflect my values, but I also believe that it should reflect Oregon values and the people of Oregon and make sure that even in our hiring practices that we are having a equity and diversity lens to make sure that that folks that are working in the Secretary of State's office look like the people of Oregon. Very good. Thank you very much, Mia, for your finishing. That's the question number two is done. Um, the next question, Shamia, you will also be answering for our rotation. I haven't um, the answered question it. Is, what? I haven't answered the question yet. Oh, Kim, I am so sorry, Kim. I had you as the middle person. Oh, okay. well, no, let me let me do that. Thank you. <laughs> Just okay. learning more over. The Secretary well, of the Office employs over 200 people. What previous experience do you have in management or overseeing staff? Terribly sorry about that. No problem. I yes, I've been in business 28 years. Started with a very small staff. It's been it's grown up to more than 50, depending on the time of year. Sometimes there can be 20, 25 projects going on at any one time. Uh, there's five, five different locations and numerous different project locations and uh, over three different states. So it's very important to have good people in, in, in managing and able to supervise and carry through the, the mission. And that is in the Secretary of State's office, we need to make sure that we're treating people well and we're service oriented and we're making sure that um, we're treating people equally, you know, in a nonpartisan fashion so that we can help them overcome or figure out the ways to move forward. And we will be of service. That's of high importance to me and that we treat people uh, well, regardless of who they are, where they come from, what they look like, any of that. And we just try to find those those ways to best serve. That's really what it just boils down to. I think that uh, government needs to be there to serve and the Secretary of State's office is exceptionally in that position to, to be of service in the corporations division and with the small business advocates office within that. And obviously with elections and dealing with initiative referendums, initiatives and referendums, as well as um, you know, the archives vision, putting more records online, just trying to make sure that people can find what they're looking for and they have clear instruction and that uh, we're working together as a team. And I think that's, that's of utmost importance to me. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate your, your comments. Um, next will be Shmia answering the next question. Yeah. What do you think is the most important issue facing the Secretary of State's office at this time? Well, I think certainly running fair and secure elections, because everything flows from trust and integrity of our democracy. But Oregon's vote by mail system has worked very well for over 20 years. And while we are currently having to combat misinformation, sadly coming from the highest office in the land, uh, Oregonians know that, this op that vote by mail has worked safely and securely for over 20 years. So I think first, uh, I think the audits division is gonna be very, very important to make sure that we look at the Oregon Employment Department, what happened, how do we fix it and make sure that it never happens again, making sure that we audit our emergency response, not only for COVID, but also for the recent wildfires. There are devastating stories of families in Southern Oregon who did not even hear, were not even given the evacuation warnings that they needed. But in particular, upcoming in 2021, I think it's very likely that the next Secretary of State will be involved in redistricting because of the delays in the U.S. Census, there's recently a bill uh, introduced, a bipartisan bill in the Senate from Lisa Murkowski for the Republicans and Brian Schatz for the Democrats to delay the census deadlines. And of course, in Oregon, if that's not done in the legislature, by July 1, then it goes to the Secretary of State. And under the delays that have been requested in the U.S. Senate, 
they wouldn't even report that data to the states until July 31st. And so I am proud to be endorsed by the organization set up by President Obama and Eric Holder, who seek to have nonpartisan independent redistricting across this country. And I'll be very proud to run a process that is independent, nonpartisan, and also rooted in our racial equity to make sure that all folks in Oregon have the representation that they deserve. I think redistricting is probably uh, one of the most important things coming up for the next Secretary of State. Thank you, Shmia. Kim, you're next. So the question is, what do you think is the most important issue facing the Secretary of State's office now? Well, obviously there are a lot of different, well, four main agencies and all of them have important things going on in them. But what's facing Oregon right now should be what is most important to the Secretary of State's office and the you know, Oregon's response to the COVID uh, unrest and wildfires, all those things just gearing us towards getting, helping and dedicating that office to trying to get Oregon back on track will be, I think, one of the most important things for me to focus on. But it's also obviously important to make sure that all the agencies and divisions within the Secretary of State's office are running well, that the elections, they get a top to bottom look, making sure that we have the best uh, the best process in place. And you know, like the audits I mentioned, uh, answering those hard questions that we're facing right now as, as Oregonians. We need to help the economy and we can help with, I think we could help with informing budget decisions at the legislature. I think that auditors can do that. And I think the auditors can also help inform policy decisions at the legislature. Redistricting is very important. And from the very beginning, I've endorsed the uh, initiative petition 57 that didn't make it. And I said that if it didn't, I would adopt the process as Secretary of State should redistricting make it to uh, my office. And so that, I think that's very important to have that. And there's, there's just a lot of things facing Oregon and that's what needs to also be most important to the Secretary of State's office. Thank you, Kim, for those comments. Um, Natalie, you're next. The question is, what do you think is the most important issue facing the Secretary of State's office now? I think that there are two key issues that are going to define whether we make it or not. The first one is uh, running elections and uh, redistricting. I agree with uh, Ms. Fagan that redistricting is going to be um, a critical issue next year. And I, I am glad that all three candidates strongly support an independent nonpartisan commission that include diversity. So I am very optimistic about the process, but I think that that's going to be a priority, having an electoral system that really functions and that is fair. The other uh, key issue that I think is gonna face Oregon and not only Oregon, but I think the world in general is climate change is here to stay and it's going to get worse because it's an exponential curve, meaning that it's not a gradual change, it's going to be a really very strong change. And so all of our emergency preparedness is going to be critical. And critical to emergency preparedness is us coming together as a community. I cannot believe that there were people mentioning arsonists in the middle of a crisis when we have to come together to push misinformation out. That sort of behavior needs to stop right away. It's not going to get us anywhere. We need to come together and walking out of uh, the legislative process because you don't want, like what's going on is also a non-starter. We need to come together, have very good emergency preparedness, good management of our forests, which includes logging, but not clear cutting. Something that really looks into long-term, how we're gonna face the major changes that we're gonna have. And we need to protect our most vulnerable communities, particularly our agricultural communities immigrant communities. We cannot do without them. And I think that um, promoting small businesses with wraparound services for small businesses is going to be critical to get our economy starting because small businesses are at the core of our economy. Thank you, Kim, for your comments. The next question, Kim, you'll be the first person. Um, the question is, this question relates to voter disenfranchisement. Non-affiliated voters are on a track to become the largest voting bloc in Oregon. And in some countries, they already are. In some counties, excuse me. Do you support an open primary and why or why not? 
You know, at first I did not support an open primary. The reason being, well, there are different ways of having an open primary. There are different levels of openness. I think it would, I encouraged the, the uh, Republican Party to open this um, recent primary to non-affiliated voters. I don't, it didn't happen for whatever reason. Um, I do think it's important to uh, include them. The world is moving in a, in a way that doesn't include partisan politics, which is very interesting to see the NAV, uh, the non-affiliated voters grow in such a population and number in the state. And I know Motor Voter has a lot to do with that, but it also speaks to the fact that people aren't changing uh, and leaving the non-affiliated voter moniker behind. They're going, uh, they're staying with that. They're, they want to be independent. That's kind of a really Oregon way of being. So I think it's very, uh, I would rather have uh, some availability for Republicans and, and Democrats and whatever uh, major party might come into being. We had the independents in there for a little while as a major party to open it to the non-affiliated voters. Thank you, Kim, for your comments. Um, next is Natalie. The question relates to voter disenfranchisement. Non-affiliated voters are on track to become the largest voting bloc in Oregon, and some counties they already are. Do you support an open primary, and why or why not? I do not support a wide or a wide, um, open primaries because I think that it is important for parties to control what, what happens in their party. Uh, with open primaries, you, you run the risk of having only two people coming up into the elections um, because it would totally overwhelm smaller parties. And I think that smaller parties have a key voice that's a dissenting voice, that's a, a unique independent voice. The way to go around open primaries and for enfranchisement of non-affiliated voters is ranked choice voting. Allowing a diversity of representation <clears throat> would provide um, non-affiliated voters much more choice and non-affiliated voters would get involved if there is there are candidates that really speak to their aspirations right now I think that there is a lack of leadership uh, particularly unfortunately in the Democratic Party I think that if the Democratic Party didn't have the Green New Deal coming from the Green Party they would not necessarily have a big platform and the Republican Party has gone a little bit way out into the margins of uh, so non-affiliated voters do not have, um, they are not having their aspirations met. That's why they're not affiliated. With ranked choice voting, what you allow is a ranking of the candidates. So the spoiler issue goes out and your second choice then becomes, um, um, if, if your first choice does not uh, meet the majority, your second vote gets counted. And so it's a way to go around this spoiler concept and it would allow for much more uh, lively and um, um, meaningful political discourse at a time when we desperately need that. So I think ranked choice voting would completely go around this issue of open primaries. No, I do not support open primaries. It's a way of disenfranchising smaller, vo smaller voices like the Green Party or the Progressive Party. Thank you, Natalie, for your comments. Um, Shamia, you're next. This question relates to voter disenfranchisement. Non-affiliated voters are on track to becoming the largest voting block in Oregon, and in some counties, they already are. Do you support an open primary, and why or why not? Well, throughout my, my legislative career, I've consistently been pro-democracy and pro-participation, and even when that's disagreed with, even when I disagree with folks in my own party, and so I have supported letting non-affiliated voters vote in, in primaries. Because of the First Amendment, no government can make and force a party to open their primaries. It has to be something that the parties do. And I have, you know, differed with the Democratic Party on this one. I've also spoken out against caucuses that the Democratic Party uses because I see those as disenfranchising voters. One of the reasons I am, um, you know, a Democrat is because it's the party of the voting, the Voting Rights Act, and it is the party um, that is pushing for you know, enfranchising voters as, as recently as this election, battling the Republican National Committee in over 21 lawsuits or 41 lawsuits across the country where the Republican National Committee is seeking to, to suppress votes uh, leading up to this election. So while I don't have the authority as a senator or as secretary of state to force parties to open their primaries, 
Um, I agree with what Natalie said about ranked choice voting. In fact, Benton County this year, Oregonians in Benton County will actually be using ranked choice voting for the first time to vote for their county commissioners. And I am very interested in Secretary of State to review and audit that information to find out, did it improve turnout? Did we have the positive impacts that we, would, that we typically would see with ranked choice voting that they've seen in Maine, for example? But finally, as Secretary of State, I would also seek to move Oregon's voter registration deadline to same day voter registration, which does help folks if they want to vote in a party primary and, and the parties choose to continue to close their primaries, somebody could actually register the same day and, for a party and be able to vote in that party's primary. Thank you very much, Mia. Um, next question, Natalie, you're first. Do you support changing the age of voter registration to 16 years of age? Why or why not? Well, I have a 14 year old and I have to say that she has very educated opinions. Um, yes, I would uh, support decreasing the voting age. I think that nowadays young people um, have really a lot of information and uh, um, a fresh voice. And I, I do think I've spoken with I've spoken with a lot of young people, 16, 17, 18 years old, um, in the protests, and I am really encouraged and amazed by how aware they are of the issues relating to their future. And I think that that voice needs to be integrated in uh, the political process. Um, I am in favor of decreasing the voting age. Thank you very much, Natalie. Next, Shmia, um, do you support changing the age of voter registration to 16 years of age? Why or why not? Well, I am so glad you brought this up because I work directly with Oregon's 16 and 17 year olds in the 2019 session. It would actually in Oregon would require a constitutional amendment. Our voting age is set in 18, at 18 in our constitution. And I first was supportive of the idea when I was out canvassing during the Parkland shooting in Florida. And I'll tell you, Oregonians were so impressed with how these young people in Florida held President Trump and Marco Rubio's feet to the fire on gun safety. And these young people said, hey, we're affected by gun violence in our schools. We're affected by climate change. We're affected by housing, the housing crisis, income inequality, college affordability, immigration laws, so much they're affected by, their very lives are affected. And so I agreed to work with them and in 2019 introduced a constitutional amendment. Turns out not very popular in Oregon, a very knee-jerk response is against it. So we weren't able to put that on the ballot, or I guess if we had put it on the ballot, it probably would have gone down in flames. But I was so excited and proud to work with these students and meet these students. And no matter whether they can vote for me or not, I will continue to work on those issues on climate change and gun safety and housing security and income inequality. Um, I, I continue to work on those issues for them as a senator. And, um, you know, it's interesting folks would, would pick the worst example of a 15 or 16 or 17 year old they could think of and say, you want that person voting? And when I testified, I gave some pretty awful examples of what things that, that voting at age adults in their 30s and 40s and 50s have done, including child abuse and, and, and gun violence. And I said, why don't we not define Oregon's 16 and 17 year olds by the worst behavior of their peers? And if we're lucky, they're not gonna define us by the worst behavior of our peers. Thank you, Shmia. Kim, you are next. Do you support changing the age of, vote, age of voter registration to 16 years of age? Why and why not? I think the current law is to allow registration of 16 and 17 year olds. I don't support voting at age 16. It's funny, I served on the, um, the uh, Judiciary Committee and we've been having a lot of discussions over uh, the few, last few um, sessions about juvenile justice and brain development. And it's, it's interesting how, you know, they don't want to, they want to make sure that kids are given a, a kind of a second chance because their brains haven't developed when they've committed some really, you know, grievous crimes. And they want to make sure that they, you know, they take into account their age because their brains haven't really developed until I think they're talking about 25, 26. And it, it's kind of funny to have this discussion saying, um, 
about voting at age 16, that I don't support. And I think it wouldn't work r real well with what we have federally. It's a requirement that you be 18. It doesn't, I mean, um, I mean, there might be situations where it could be, you could talk to me about it, but I don't overall support voting at age 16, though it is current law to register to vote at age 16 or 17. Thank you, Kim. Um, thank you for the answers. The next question, Tania, you're up for this. The recent wildfires have displaced many voters. Do you have any recommendations to improve the process of vote by mail, such as in these natural disasters? Well, first off, I think it's super important for folks whose lives have been turned upside down right now to not be given this information or be unnecessarily scared that their votes won't count. Vote by mail has had them covered for over 20 years, even if they can't get to a county elections office because of roads being shut down, for example. They can go on OregonVotes.org slash MyVote, as Secretary Clarno has said, and have their ballot literally sent anywhere in the world. Um, they can call their county elections office and have their ballot sent elsewhere. Um, I think it's important that when we talk about things like expanding in-person voting, particularly to places like city halls, you know, have folks actually called, you know, the 240 plus city managers and mayors in Oregon to ask if they're equipped to turn their city halls into in-person polling places and to comport with the very strict chain of custody requirements in order to make sure that we have secure elections. Um, have folks called all 36 county clerks? I know I have personally called through all 36 county clerks in the last couple of months to reach out and make sure they have my personal cell phone number. Um, I think those are the folks that should be reached out to to find out what they need, not imposing new requirements on them, particularly when it comes to in-person voting, because, you know, there's big concerns about the chain of custody requirements to make sure that we have secure elections here in Oregon. So folks who've been displaced, you know, I think to suggest that they need a whole bunch of changes, unfortunately, is, is political theater at a time when the last thing these folks need is more drama in their lives. Thank you very much, Mia. Kim, you're next. The recent wildfires have displaced many voters. Do you have any recommendations to improve the process by, of vote by mail, such as in these natural disasters? Thank you, yes. The vote by mail has anticipated a lot of uh, issues that could happen uh, where a voter might be prevented from getting their own ballot from their own home. Uh, in this case, yes, you do have the county clerk's offices available to uh, change an address, calling them. And that is only if you know where you're going to be. These people might not necessarily know where they're going to be. There's a lot of moving around, a lot of uncertainty. There is, um, you know, knowing where you're gonna be by, the, by, by October 13th isn't necessarily going to be the situation with many of these people. So it would make sense to have these uh, places where ballots could be made available. And city halls have security. Uh, if, there, if there are some cities that don't wanna participate, it would not be foisted upon them, but it certainly would be better to have uh, secure buildings that the counties could uh, set up to uh, accommodate in-person voting and accommodate people getting a, a provisional ballot if they didn't have their addresses figured out by the time the deadline rolls around in October. Uh, not only that, um, we've done in-person voting. I, I've lived through it, I've done it. Um, there, there are places that it can happen. We used to do it at the school that's locally. We just have to figure out some places and make them available uh, especially when we're having to accommodate many road closures. It's just difficult enough to live life right now for some of these people to just then tell them they have to go maybe 100 miles out of their way to get somewhere. Um, but definitely um, accommodating, anticipating these types of things maybe in the future would be wise to do. So we make sure we accommodate these people. Thank you, Kim. Um, Natalie, you're next. The recent wildfires have displaced many voters. Do you have any recommendations to improve the process of vote by mail, such as in these natural disasters? Yes, it is really disheartening to see what happened in Southern Oregon. 
um, I do believe that um, um, the uh, county clerks and the regional offices should be able to provide ballots. Um, and uh, I, with you know, modern technology and particularly the pandemic, have really changed fundamentally how our economy is going to function in the future. Uh, just look at this meeting we're having on Zoom. So many people are meeting on Zoom. I think that uh, ballots should be available online. So you could verify your identity, your information, and receive a ballot. I, I think that that should be a non, I mean, it, it should be automatic. I don't understand why we're not having it. You know, you, there, if you're able to pay your taxes, to buy things and verify your identity that way online, it should be also made available for voting. Um, technology is here, people use it, and it, it, there, it should be, it shouldn't be a problem, it should be a question. Um, I think that uh, to facilitate the process right now uh, for people to receive their ballots, um, it, it's just such a challenge. Um, um, then you, I think that we need to support the organizations on the ground, like CAUSA Oregon, the League of Women Voters, to help those on the ground participate in the electoral process. Um, CAUSA Oregon is a phenomenal organization that is on the ground and will help people, regardless of affiliation, to, uh, re to receive their, to make sure that they receive what they need. Um, so it is going to be a challenge. Thank you, Natalie. Um, at the end, I'll be giving a little information for people who are having issues with that. The next question, um, Kim, you are first up. The congressional and legislative districts will be redrawn in 2021. If the state legislature does not agree, the redistricting becomes your responsibility as, so, as the Secretary of State. How do you plan to tackle that project if you become the Secretary of State? Thank you, yes. I would like to uh, use the process that has been put in place or was put in place and proposed in IP 57, Initiative Petition 57, having to do with independent redistricting. We need to get some uh, of these folks together to lay out the process and then get these uh, independent commissioners chosen so that we can uh, take the partisanship out of it and look at Oregon as a whole and look at our communities and look at the boundary lines and look at the, the transportation uh, that the communities share and just kind of move forward with a uh, proposal that just does not, does not take into account all the partisanship that seems to prevail in these processes. At least it did back in 2011 when I was there, though the legislature did uh, in a rare occasion uh, agree to the redistricting plan. So it did not actually get elevated to the Secretary of State's office in that case. But most of the time they do get kicked up to the Secretary of State. At least that's what history seems to show. Uh, and I think that uh, taking it out of the legislature's hands like IP57 was proposing is a much better idea. Having legislators draw the lines for their own districts, it seems a little perhaps self-serving and it seems like a little bit of a conflict of interest, though that is our process. That is what was set up in our constitution. Um, I, I kind of wish we had been able to change it uh, during this last round. However, I can still promise to put into place this process as Secretary of State should the redistricting reach my office. Thank you, Kim. Next, Natalie. The question is, the congressional and legis legislative districts will we be redrawn in 2021. If the state legislature does not agree, the redistricting becomes the Secretary of State's responsibility. How do you plan to tackle the project if you become Secretary of State? I also believe that an independent commission that integrates um, a current political landscape as well as a full diversity and integration of usually marginalized voices is going to be very important. So starting right away to decide and, and set up a commission would be the way to go. I don't have much more further to agree because I think that all three candidates are on board with this, with an independent commission. And, and that's one of the joys of working particularly with women. Um, 
as a potential candidates, we like to get along. So um, let's all move forward and start working on a, creating an independent commission because it's going to be a reality in Oregon. Thank you, Natalie. Mia, the congressional legislative districts will be redrawn in 2021. If the state legislature does not agree, the redistricting becomes the responsibility of the Secretary of State. How do you plan to tackle the project if you become Secretary of State? Redistricting charts who Oregon will be for the next decade in our representation and is an incredibly important role if the Secretary of State does play this. And I have given this a lot of thought First off, I think it's important for Oregonians to know that we already have robust protections within the law that lay out how it should be done. They have to have a minimum of 15 hearings, 10 of them before the lines are drawn, at least five more after the lines are drawn, one in each congressional district, one in each district that has seen the biggest population shift. Um, the, the redistricting statutes already require that they are not drawn to benefit any political party or any particular person, that they be, um, they don't separate communities of interest. So there's already robust protections. I think what's missing is an independent commission doing that. So there is not a question about legislators' conflict of interest. I was not in the legislature during the last time redistricting was done, but I do understand that legislators, you know, there is a conflict there of folks drawing their own district boundaries. I think the important thing that we don't follow the models that have failed in other states um, to actually reach diversity and equity goals, particularly since in our country's founding, um, not all folks were considered real and full people in the initial census counts in our country. So I think it's important for us to address those systemic inequities and not perpetuate those through a, a redistricting commission that is overwhelmingly white upper class people doing the redistricting. So I think that centering that and making sure that the commission looks like Oregon is important. I think the biggest key there is to make sure that you pay folks to do this work. If folks are gonna do tedious, time consuming, important government work, legislators are paid when they do redistricting with a daily stipend. I think that anybody that serves on this commission should also be paid so that that opens it up to folks who work for a living and couldn't afford to do this work for free. Thank you very much, Mia. Um, Kim, wait, I'm sorry, that was the end of that question. Um, we are going to ask one more. one more question and then we're going to go to the closing, our closing, I was gonna say arguments, but closing statements. <laughs> and um, Natalie, you're first in this. In promoting business in Oregon, how important is it that you to you that these new businesses bring with them living wage jobs, employ benefits, and preserve our clean air and water. Excuse me, can you repeat the second part of the question, please? Oh, okay. Um, how important is it to you that these new businesses bring with them living wage jobs, employ benefits, and preserve our clean air and water? I think that um, um, small businesses have a key role to play. I think that the minimum wage in the, in the United States is um, a poverty wage that do not allow people to live with dignity. And uh, so we actually end up paying with our taxes uh, assistance for people because they cannot pay for their own um, basic needs with the minimum wage. We need a living wage throughout the country. A living wage is calculated such that um, a person's, a, 30, a maximum of 30% of a person's wage is spent on housing and the rest is spent on education, food, clothing, health, et cetera, et cetera. So the benefits of a living wage, of a universal living wage, is that it can be adjusted to the cost of living of each locality so that your wages in the United States are not gonna compete with wages anywhere else uh, or in other places because it's pegged to the cost of living on a location. It also allows people for work that is meaningful, that allows them to sustain themselves without having to recourse to food stamps or other when they're working. Um, so a living wage is gonna be very important but cannot penalize small businesses. So, a small businesses um, should be helped to have a good business plan and a wraparound service so they can sustain and, and create good budgets so they can um, adjust their, their uh, the 
the price for their services and their goods, um, but the living wage benefits and uh, sustainable environment should be the goal of um, any society, really. It's, it's, it's basic. We just need to make it, find ways to um, become a reality. And that's why I think that alternative voices are so important. Thank you, Natalie, very much. Um, Shmia, you're next. In promoting businesses in Oregon, how important is it to you that these new businesses bring with them living wage jobs, employ benefits, and preserve our clean air and water? Well, as a person, uh, as a voter, as an Oregonian, uh, those are very important values to me. But I want to be clear and not overpromise what I can do as our Secretary of State. Our Secretary of State, the Audits Division, is a powerful tool to audit state agencies under the Constitution or to audit state-aided institutions, be it private businesses or charities, but not the Secretary of State doesn't have the authority, at least has not in the past, to just go audit private companies at, at will. They can audit state revenues that go into private companies or entities, uh, but not just at will. So as much as I support those things as a person, and certainly Oregon's next Secretary of State is also the Lieutenant Governor in our state. So I, I want to be clear that I, I Happy to answer the question, understanding that, you know, the, as lieutenant governor, the views of, of Oregon, of, of a secretary of state candidate on those are important issues. And certainly as a state senator, I've been proud to be endorsed by hundreds of thousands of working people across our state. The firefighters who are out fighting the wildfires, the electricians who are building our buildings. Hey, babe, just a second. My kids just got home. Just a minute, baby. I'm in the middle of my answer. Hey, <laughs> and I'm a mom. Um, and so, you know, I've been proud to be supported by hundreds of thousands of working people across the state. You guys, please hang on one second. I'm in the middle of answering a question. I only have 34 more seconds, okay? <laughs> um, and so I've been proud to be supported by them because those do reflect my values. I do support uh, making sure that folks who obviously want to come do business here live Oregon values. And it, but as Secretary of State, I will stay within my lane and only use the tools as they are appropriately used. Thank you very much, Mia. Kim, you're next in promoting businesses in Oregon. How important is it to you that these new businesses bring with them living wage jobs, employ benefits, and preserve our clean air and water? Uh, to me as a person, absolutely important. It does not rate, relate directly to the work of the Secretary of State's office, though. Uh, obviously, it's important to have a healthy economy. And many of these small businesses are micro businesses. They don't even employ people other than themselves. They are a one person shop. And these people are uh, sometimes the, the barriers that are in their way are very difficult to overcome. And that's one important role that the, uh, the small business advocate can play um, to serve as a welcome mat to not only these micro businesses, but other businesses that want to come. And I want to help all of them, as long as they're legal businesses, uh, want to help them succeed in our state because our we are a small business state. And uh, if Oregon's small businesses are doing well, then the employees and people working for them can do well and pay their bills and pay their taxes so that government services can be provided, the ones that Oregonians expect to be provided. So it's important to have this healthy economy and help all these businesses. And as a Secretary of State in charge of the Small Business Advocate, that's what I would be uh, focused on is, is trying to get Oregon back on track and, and, and help these small businesses get going again. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you very much, Kim, and the candidates. I'd like to thank you all for answering all of these questions and doing such a great job of it. Um, next, we will be doing the closing statements and we will begin with Natalie. Thank you very much for the League of Motors for the opportunity to uh, discuss these issues. Um, again, as a Secretary of State, I think that we're gonna require a lot of leadership um, particularly because uh, climate change is a reality and it's going to get worse. So we we'll need to have um, vision and strategies to um, implement much improved emergency response systems and that supersede um, convictions. I mean, 
we, we cannot allow ourselves again to descend into misinformation and disinformation that divides people, like the disinformation that arsonists are setting the fires and setting up roadblocks. That is not going to get us anywhere. And so as the current Secretary of State, I will focus on uh, involving the community and increasing capacity within the community to respond to wildfires, particularly because the Secretary of State um, has a, the management of the land trust um, and sits on the land board so we can play a role in bringing stakeholders into that process and also ensuring that redistricting is uh, fair and I think that we all agree on an independent commission so that's wonderful to hear that Oregon can be so progressive um, and in terms of election facilitating the process for people to vote and implementing ranked choice voting increasing the choice of candidates in the field so that we can increase the number of non-affiliated voters and set up Oregon as one of the examples across the country where we can have multi multiple voices coming into the electoral process. So those would be some key um, objectives of mine as the Secretary of State. And so please vote green, vote for me in uh, the elections and send a strong message that you want really uh, um, at, um, groundbreaking different new ways to do things. Thank you very much, Natalie. Shamia, your closing statement, please. Well, first off, thank you to the League of Women Voters and the City Club, and also to Natalie and Kim uh, for this wonderful and robust discussion on the issues. I think that the number one security threat that our elections are facing here in Oregon in the future, just one moment, Other than uh, moms getting distracted in the middle of their really slamming closing statement is misinformation. That's the biggest threat that we face. And regardless of where that comes from, we need a secretary of state who's willing to stand up. And I have been willing to stand up to my own party when I had disagreed. And I've been obviously willing to stand up to this president who has been spreading misinformation. We need a secretary of state who will stand up to Donald Trump's lies about vote by mail not one who will parrot them as talking points throughout a campaign to try and appeal to his base. And so I wanna say unequivocally that claims of widespread voter fraud in vote by mail are a myth. And they're a myth perpetrated by people who want to make it harder for certain groups of people to vote. And Oregonians deserve a secretary of state who will stand by vote by mail, who will stand up to misinformation regardless of where that comes from, so that all Oregonians, regardless of their party registration, regardless of how they have voted in the past or how they will vote in the future, can have trust and faith in the integrity of elections here in Oregon. My name is Shamia Fagan. You can find out more information at shamiafororegon.com. And I would love to have your vote this October or this November as you're voting by mail. Thank you, Shamia. Kim, you're next with your closing statement. Thank you. Thank you, League of Women Voters and the City Club of Deschutes County. I, I look back at when I announced my run for Secretary of State in early February and the problems facing Oregon then just pale, absolutely pale in comparison to what we're facing now. Today's high unemployment, uh, civil months of civil unrest, and then uh, massive wildfires and displaced people and the economic fallout. Clearly, Oregon needs strong leadership to help deal with these challenges. I would ask voters to look at my track record of strong, steady leadership. I've been in my community, community of Kaiser for a very long time. I've raised my family there, established two long-standing businesses there. I'm rooted there. I kept serving the public to help my community that I love. I've weathered the economic storms in the legislature uh, with hard policy decisions. Uh, also within you know the, the budget cuts uh, over the last 16 years that we've dealt with. Um, if voters compare my record of leadership to my opponents, I think they will be able to make the right choice in October or November. I want to uh, have make sure that my, pri the, my primary principles in my, my campaign are accountability, transparency, and integrity in our government and getting that confidence that people need and trust rebuilt in uh, the people's government. These are similar values of my good friend, the late Dennis Richardson. And when he was Secretary of State, I think he raised the bar a bit. I, I, I view this office very similar to the way he did as 
having nonpartisan responsibilities and mostly administrative and managerial functions. I don't see this as a, a position to be anybody, any particular uh, parties Secretary of State or, or, or part of Oregon's Secretary of State, it's Oregon's Secretary of State. And in fact, during my campaign, I won the nomination from the Independent Party of Oregon. I, I want all Oregonians to see that I will run things by the book, even handedly. And I hope voters will take a look at my website, kimthatcher.com. Thank you very much for those closing arguments. Thank you, Kim. Um, in closing, I, we, the League of Women Voters and City Club, want to thank the candidates for participating in today's forum. The City Club and League of Women Voters are getting the information out, and we're very proud and we're very thankful that you were willing to participate. Remember, if you enjoyed today's forum and would like to help cover the cost, please consider making a donation to the City Club on their website, cityclubco.org, or the League of Women Voters, lwvdeschutes.org, if you would care to do that. If you're interested in becoming a member or making a contribution, please contact the League through their website, again, lwvdeschutes.org. If you're interested in becoming Oh, I'm sorry, that was copied twice. Thanks to our Candidates Forum series sponsors, the Deschutes Public Library and Buchanan Schmidt LLC. The next Candidate Forum will be the Redmond Mayor and will air, Tuesday, will air tomorrow, <laughs> September 30th? Yes, September 30th, th thanks, at 7 p.m., same place, City Club of Central Oregon YouTube channel. Please be sure to watch. This video will be available after 7 p.m. tonight. And I thank you for your interest in and helping keep democracy working. This is pre-recorded earlier today. Thank you candidates and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>